Recording. Yay. Yay. This is exciting. Yes. I can't wait for only our moms to listen. It's going to be great. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be pretty maybe, cool. Maybe Brandon and Abrata listen. Yeah. I, yeah. Our Everyone, friends will probably listen. People we know. We we know. Six people. Dozens. No. Make us sound better. We know yeah. dozens of people. Dozens of people. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Uh, welcome to our first episode. I was going to say inaugural but I can't pronounce that correctly, apparently. So maybe <laughs> I won't say that. Inaugural. This is a great start. Yes, I can't it's going. speak English, the only language I know. Well, welcome to Death Dames, yeah. where we kind of pick apart your favorite true crime stories and our favorite true crime stories and uh, really take a look at them from a scientific and, I guess, historical viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we do. That's what we do. All right. Well, we'll introduce ourselves first, I guess. Uh, my name is Kimberly Baker. I don't know why I said Kimberly. I go by Kim. Everyone calls me Kim. So I'm Kim. I study archaeology and anthropology. And I focus usually on ancient cultures, uh, specifically ancient Egypt. But I've also done work in other fields as well. I also study human culture. Specifically, I've spent a lot of time around the culture of death and death cults. Hi, I'm Allie Newick. I study biology, specifically marine biology, but anything really in the science field is super interesting to me. I like marine mammals, also sharks and <laughs> skates and rays and that kind too. Now with more but sharks. Yeah, yeah. no, I really enjoy sharks and like seals and manatees. Manatees are great. But yeah, anything really that has to do with science. I enjoy chemistry a lot. So yeah. I know, it's kind of awkward. This feels like an interview. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. I mean, I guess it, I guess technically it is, it's the first episode. Yeah. So this is kind of our interview with you, the listener, to see if you uh, like us. Yeah. If we get hired. Please like us. <laughs> Please like us. So we do, you know, we thought it'd be fun to kind of share this with other people and open it up to other people and maybe start debates with people who want to listen to us as well. So we do consider this to be a true crime slash science slash history yes. slash comedy podcast. But the main focus of it is going to be true crime stories or uh, any kind of stories that revolve around death. So what got us into true crime? I think every day coming home after school and watching either like an episode of CSI or Bones because that was just what was on. Mm, Bones, yeah. Bones. Just that kind of interested me in it a little more. I mean, that's just kind of where it started. I would just watch that. I found it was interesting and started doing more research on my own. Yeah, I was goth in high school, still kind of (laughs) am. So I was always really into um, morbid topics. And even growing up, I was fascinated by the ancient Egyptians who are very death centric. A a big thing that I would do is like a same sort of thing, though. I would come home. CSI was always like right after dinner. And um, I would always go over my friend's house. We'd watch CSI. But also with true crime, too. In high school and college, I took a lot of like criminology courses and I took forensic science and I just really liked it. It was never something I wanted to do as a career, Mm -hmm. but it was always something that I was really interested in. Uh, What we're going to do then, I think we've done a fairly thorough intro. Yeah. Thoroughly awkward. Yeah. One might say. Yep. Yeah. I think we should get into some actual topics before people leave. Yeah. No, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. 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 Good idea. Uh, So... Uh, Basically how this is going to work, I am a storyteller. So what I'm going to do is tell everyone a story. Are you excited for me to tell you a story? very excited. I want to know how, what you told me to research. (laughs) Okay, yeah, so I didn't explain the rest of it to everyone. So Allison doesn't know the topic that we'll be talking about. I pick the topic and then I come up with a research topic that may or may not directly relate to the story, but it relates to something pertaining to the story. So for today's episode, for our first episode, I wanted to pick a story that represented us, uh, it has things about it that have to do with us and our family. The research topic I gave Allison was to look into shark bites and shark attacks. Which is my shit. It is her shit. It's going to take a while in this story okay. for you to figure out what the hell a shark has to do with it. Okay. But we're going to get there. I promise. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to talk about, and it's it's a fairly well-known story, and you might know it. Uh, it is the story of the Lady of the Dunes. I have never heard of it. No? No. No. All right, cool. Well, the reason that I chose this story 
is this is an unsolved cold case mm. from Provincetown, Massachusetts. Oh, good. Which is in uh, Cape Cod. It's a tip yep. of Cape Cod. And uh, growing up, good our family P-town. spent... Good old P-Town. Uh, growing up, our family spent a lot of time in Cape Cod. Mm-hmm. Uh, Every summer until my sister was born. Yeah. She was, she just, we were just she like, you know what? It. We can't. Yeah. No more. <laughs> no more. No more people can fit in this house. You made too many babies. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so Cape Cod has a pretty, it's got good memories for us. So I thought oh, yeah. let's ruin them with a horrible unsolved murder. So today, 2019, we're going to travel to the 1970s. Ooh. It's Ooh. a great time. It's a great time. A time of rebellion. Mm-hmm. A tumultuous time. Yes. A time where pretty much everything was brown or yep. orange or mm-hmm. yellow mm-hmm. or like a brownish, orangish, orangish yellow yellow. color. Yeah. 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 Lots of bell bottoms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Flowers everywhere. Flowers everywhere. Exactly. Um, you know, the year, in fact, is the summer of 1974. And at this time, Watergate is happening. We're like right in the middle of the Watergate scandal, uh, which is causing a pretty good sized distrust in people in terms of how they feel towards the government. Also in 1974, Stephen King's first book, Carrie, is oh, released. Ooh. Which is uh, one of my favorite Stephen King books, which is still somewhat relatable to the story. Oh. Oh. Oh, Sharks and Stephen King, you got me. Foreshadowing. Yes. <laughs> we're going to talk about Cape Cod. So specifically, we're going to talk about Provincetown, Massachusetts. Uh, now, for those of you who aren't locals, we are both Massachusetts locals. We've lived here our whole lives. Um, but for, to those of you who don't know the area, uh, Provincetown is located on the tip of Cape Cod. It is surrounded by beautiful beaches, lots of cool places to eat eat uh, all the mini golf you could ever imagine cape cod itself is mini golf mecca i would it's say it's amazing mm. that's where my mini golf career started your, mini golf, your career is a yes. mini oh, yes. golf champion yeah oh Great. yeah that's i did not know that i was in the presence of mini golf greatness uh-huh oh yeah not real golf just mini golf <laughs> <laughs> but anyways yes so uh cape cod it's a hub for local artists as well uh even today Provincetown is a major tourist destination. Uh, It's known to be the place to visit when you're going to the Cape with your family and friends. Currently, uh, Provincetown, also called P-Town, which we called it before, Mm -hmm. uh, it's also known for being a mecca of um, LGBTQ rights. Mm -hmm. And it has been for decades, which is really, really cool. It's a very open-minded community. Yes. um, And it's a big... It's a good time. It's just, you can go out there and everyone's happy and no one's really judgy. And yeah, you can just it's kind not, of be yourself. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, I know I've gone recently and I feel like it's become a little more touristy. Yeah. Also, funny story, an eight-year-old me was very convinced that I'd actually seen Cher when I went there when I was a <laughs> child. Uh, I was pretty sure it was the Cher uh, until my mom, of course, awkwardly informed me that I did not, in fact, see Cher, but a particularly well-done drag queen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which was upsetting at the time for me, not because I had an issue with gender, but... Because my dreams of meeting Cher were crushed. Back to the sad story. On July 26th, 1974, the peaceful town of Provincetown was shaken by the discovery of the Lady of the Dunes. In the Race Point Dunes, which is about a mile east of the Race Point Ranger Station, the nude, decomposed body of a woman was discovered by a teenage girl out walking her dog. The dog was a beagle, by oh, the way. The dog probably found it. Like, I found it. Guys, I found the thing. Did you guys see that? Mm-hmm. I found it. I found it. I found it. Beagles are the loudest dogs ever, too. Oh, my so, goodness. So I just feel bad, too, for that girl, because it's like, can you imagine you just discovered a corpse, and on top of that, you just have a like, screeching beagle in your ears? Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, so the girl, understandably, called the authorities and they rushed the, to the scene of the crime. The cause of death was a blow to the head uh, to the point where the left side of her skull had been completely crushed. Unfortunately, due to the level of decomposition, there was some issue getting a clear age. Uh, but the estimate at the time was that the victim was between 20 to 40 years old. Which, that's a good estimate. Yeah, that's, I know. <laughs> it's like, she's not a child, but she's not an old woman. Yes. <laughs> uh, which, uh, that estimate would put her birth date from around 1925 to 1954. So she was described as being fit with an athletic build. Uh, it said she weighed approximately 145 pounds uh, with a height of around 5'6 to 5'7. She had long auburn to reddish blonde hair which was pulled back into a ponytail 
and it was bound with a rubber type hair tie slash barrette. How does that work? I know. I think that was just like... A man who has never used yes. any kind of hair product. Yeah, it's like some dad when you, you just want to put your hair up in a ponytail and they're like, bring me the barrette. It's like, no, no one calls them that, dad. They're just It's just rubber bands, just a hair tie. This part's actually really sad. Uh, her toenails are painted pink. Oh. It was probably done for like a summer trip, you know? Yeah. Get your nails done because you're going on vacation. Yeah. Uh, she was found nude. However, there was a pair of Wrangler jeans folded neatly and placed under her head. Kind of like a makeshift pillow. Oh. Uh, they also found a blue bandana folded along with, with the jeans as well. Uh, no shirt, bra, underwear, or shoes were recovered at the scene, meaning either the killer took them with them or the victim was moved to this location. She was lying face down on one side of a light green, heavy cotton beach blanket as though she was sharing the space with someone else imagine the beach blankets on the ground yeah she's lying on like one half of it okay so her body's half kind of like half on half off it it's like you know if you were lying on a towel with somebody yeah you might not entirely fit on the towel together yeah so she kind of was like half off the towel something particularly interesting to the investigators was the extensive dental work that she had had done Mm. this is crazy So the killer had removed several of her teeth, but what remained still showed signs of incredibly expensive dental work. And it was done in what they referred to as the Newark style of dentistry, which to me makes me think it was like, I don't know, done really quickly (laughs) because every time I'm in New York, everyone's in a rush. Yes. Regardless, the the gold crowns alone were worth $5,000 up to $10,000. And that is what they were worth at the time in 1974. Wait, and so the murderer took teeth, but not those teeth? Exactly. I'm confused. Yes. And so I did the math, and in modern currency, her dental work would have been between twenty six and $51,000. Holy shit. And that's like just the... Is that like talking like the procedure as well or just the actual pieces? I think it's the... Including like the... Yeah, like yeah. The, the amount of all the work done. Okay. Including. Because I think like the teeth that were capped were worth like 5000 Okay. But then the rest was kind of... Because I, yeah. I did see lots of different variations on it mm. saying from between 5000 to 10000 So somewhere yeah, in that yeah. number. But I mean... I mean, even still, even if it was only 5000 that's still $26,000 in current currency. Yeah. That is an astronomical amount of work to get done. I would have never gone to the dentist ever. That's a car. Yeah. That's <laughs> literally more than my car. Yeah. That's a great deal of work to be done. Which, I mean, it's an insane amount of money for the average consumer. And also the fact that nobody knew her. Oh, yeah. The most disturbing part of the discovery, however, was the way that the killer had butchered the corpse. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Upon investigating the remains, it was quickly discovered that the victim's hands had been cut off. One was severed at the wrist and the other was missing below the elbow. And they were actually never recovered. Hmm. Yeah. Of course, no fingerprints. These were presumably resumed, yeah, removed by the killer. So the victim could not be identified using fingerprinting. Which now wouldn't be that much of a problem because we have DNA. But at the time, I mean, fingerprinting was... That was it. That was it, yeah. That was pretty much the most common form of identification. So, I mean, without the use of DNA at the time, obviously, they didn't have anything they could compare it to. And that was also why some of those teeth were taken. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. To try it, because dental records were used a lot, too. Uh, Her head also was nearly severed from her body. Um, oh, it, yeah, it, it would have most likely been done using an instrument similar to a military entrenching tool. Uh, so I did look up what that was because I don't know military equipment. <laughs> and um, it's also called an e-tool, which just to me sounds like a douchebag you would see on the internet. Yes. He's not just a tool. He's, He's an, an e-tool. e-tool. <laughs> Uh, But it's actually, it's a collapsible spade used by military forces for a variety of military purposes. Mm -hmm. So it's basically like a portable shovel kind of thing. They never found a murder weapon. The estimated date of death was uh, from 10 days up to three weeks. Ooh, that makes me think that wasn't done there then. Because somebody with no hands on almost severed head and bashed in skull skull laying on the hot beach in july for three weeks somebody other than this little girl and the dog would have noticed right and we do i do get into that a little bit later i i because there's a quite a bit of speculation about it um yeah so the estimated date then 
if they did that 10 days to three weeks time, it kind of put the date that she was murdered in late June, early July. But again, part of it was decomp was such an issue. As like you had said, like she was lying out in the July sun. So it provided access to all manner of animal and bug life, not to mention just I mean, the heat, it's July. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, too, she wasn't in like a really open area, but mm-hmm. I'm sure she was still getting, there was still sun hitting yeah. her. So like, I'm sure the sun would yeah. messing with it too. So. Question. Yes. Do you get sunburnt when you're dead or does it just start decomposition? Faster? I think it just would speed up decomp. Yeah. Cause it's sunburns and inflammation. So you. Yeah. Would well, that. cause sunburn is from blood flow. That's yeah. why you turn pink. Okay. It's cause there's more blood going to your skin cause your skin's burnt. I think. Yeah. I don't actually know. I'm not no, a doctor. <laughs> No, I don't think you do. Okay, carry yeah, on. Yeah, that's fine. So this part's kind of rough. Uh, unfortunately, there were signs of sexual abuse, uh, but it appeared post-mortem. Oh. The cause of the trauma was not recovered, uh, but she was sexually molested with some type of wooden object. The exact Ew. object has not been identified. There was no sign of a struggle, and she was laying in an undisturbed pile of pine needles. So that was definitely kind of weird, too. Yeah. Because it's so easy to move pine needles around. Yeah. And if, if somebody was coming after you, and that's why, too, they believe the sexual assault was postmortem. Because yeah. you'd be seeing signs of a struggle if someone was doing that. Yeah. There were two sets of footprints found leading to the body, and tire tracks were located 50 yards from the scene. The appearance of the two sets of footprints combined with the lack of struggle suggested to police at the time that either she knew who her, t- her attacker was or that she was sleeping at the time. There are several differing opinions I found online regarding the placement of the body. According to Warren Tobias, he was he is the uh, retired acting police chief in Provincetown. He believes that she was posed. His He was quoted as saying, uh, she was definitely posed there. She was lying out on a beach towel as if she was sunbathing. Uh, the area in which she was recovered was marked with blood. Most likely, though, that was from the removal of the hands and the partial decapitation. But some authorities believe that the victim had been slain somewhere else days earlier, if not weeks earlier. To me, though, if you killed someone mm-hmm. and you didn't want someone finding out, why would you partially remove the head and remove the limbs at the dump site, wouldn't you, if you had killed her somewhere else, wouldn't yeah. you have removed the hands, removed the teeth, removed the head? Wouldn't you do that before dumping the body? It could could have been an afterthought. He could have been like panicked to get rid of it, and like he dumped and he's like, oh shit, I need. There are all these things that can let them know who she is. Yeah, it it's just it is interesting to me though. Because yeah. it just seems like if you had the premeditation to kill her somewhere else and then think, okay, this would be a good place to dump her, then why would you choose, like, while well, you're sitting there at the scene where you could be found at any moment, why yeah. would you take that time to it's true. remove incriminating evidence? Her body was left in a scenic, serene area, which was just like a dozen feet from the sand pass people used to explore the coast. So she's in a relatively well-traveled area, which... Personally, I think does kind of lead credence to the theory that she was moved, considering the level of decay would suggest that she began decomp elsewhere. Because like you were saying, I mean, it's kind of off the beaten pathish, but I would say not in July. I mean, July in There's literally people everywhere. Yes. And there's lots of people hiking and walking the dunes. Definitely. There's even like little cabins near those dunes. Yeah. Like, if is. she was just dead and they had her face down with, like, like and had covered the spot and she wasn't, like, halfway decapitated, missing hands. Right. Then maybe people could just think she was sunbathing in a really inconvenient location. But you'd think after the second, like, if somebody walks that spot a second time and she still hasn't moved. From where you could see her from where it was being walked, mm-hmm. she did just kind of look like a person lying down. Because you didn't see all the messed up. Cause yeah. Yeah. The, the, the stumps where her hands were were kind of pushed into the pine needles. Oh, okay. So it could have looked like she was, like, just resting her hands in the pine needles. Yeah. However, uh, former police chief James Meads, uh, he was the, actually the original investigator of the crime. Uh, he has a different theory. He insists that the body was not dumped but killed where she was found. Uh, he kind of points to the blood at the scene, which uh, he thinks, in his opinion, it was consistent with the murder and the removal of the hands. He also states, uh, whoever did this to her, she went out there with. She was sharing that towel with someone. This, I mean, it does fit with the discovery of the two footprints leading to the scene. 
But that could also just mean that the killer had an accomplice, too, if they were dumping the bodies. So from here, we'll move on to to the line of potential identities that have been uh, investigated for the victim. Uh, There have been a couple leads, and we'll start with the one that was considered to be the most promising. Uh, Around the time that the victim was found in the dunes, a young woman named Rory Jean Kiesinger was involved, along with a group of her friends, in gun running and drug smuggling. And were being chased by federal authorities from Alaska... To California, to Texas, <laughs> to Kansas. Oh. Pretty much all the way across the United States. Uh, eventually, though, it led them to Pembroke, Massachusetts. Kiesinger and her compatriots were arrested one night in a drug raid in Pembroke, where Kiesinger attempted to shoot a police officer. During the process of disarming her, Kiesinger was injured by police and was then taken to Jordan Hospital, where she took another officer's gun and tried to shoot the same police officer again. So he tried, she took... <laughs> A police officer's gun, and she tried to shoot that police officer, or did she go and find the first police officer (laughs) that she tried to shoot? I'm guessing both the police officer whose gun she took and the police officer that she had previously pointed a gun at were together. Okay. I don't think she was just like, give me your gun. Now where's your friend? (laughs) (laughs) That's what I'm picturing. Yeah, so she went after that police officer again, and that police officer probably really wished she'd stayed home that day. Yeah. 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 (laughs) But yeah, so uh, Kiesinger was apprehended and incarcerated in the Plymouth County Jail, but she escaped with the help of her corrections officer and then was never heard from again. Uh, I wonder where she went. Do you get to that? Mm, Well, I mean, she's a suspect of the corpse that they found. Oh, yeah. Now, after she escaped, Pembroke police continued pressing drug charges against her compatriots she was apprehended with, but two of them had particularly interesting and disturbing things to say. When questioned about the whereabouts of their co-conspirator, who had escaped police custody, one of the subs... One of the subjects... One of the suspects told police she was, quote, pushing up daisies. Hmm. Yes. Uh, So, for those who don't know, uh, this is actually a folk idiom. It was pretty popular in the time, which referenced the idea that someone will be dead and buried and is typically used in the future tense. For example, I will be pushing up daisies before this problem is solved, etc. Mm. Yeah. Now, it, it could be alluding to the fact that this suspect might have believed that Kiesinger was not yet dead, but soon to be. Hmm. Uh, the other person they interrogated said, quote, you'll never find her. Now, to me, this isn't necessarily seems sinister given the fact that she had just escaped police custody but i mean to the police at the time to given the fact that they had thought they had found her remains in cape cod like it could have been perceived as kind of foreshadowy Mm -hmm. so not long after kiesinger's escape the lady of the dunes was discovered nearby in provincetown mass Uh, the body that was discovered matched kiesinger a lot like especially in 1970s she does look a lot like the recreations that were going around at the time Mm. she was not actually considered connected to the case until the 1970s or 1990s though oh yeah so at first they didn't even have any idea who lady of the dunes could have been Mm -hmm. uh but that changed when tobias took over for chief meads and he believed kind of right from the get-go that kiesinger was related to this case but unfortunately they only had her fingerprints from when she was arrested and well that's convenient yeah And the killer was clearly prepared because no fingerprints could be matched to the handless Lady of the Dunes. They were also unable to get any copies of uh, Kiesinger's medical records. So they were not able to get her dental records, which would have resolved things pretty quickly, too. She was a gun runner and a drug smuggler? Correct. Money. Right. So it seems kind of, yeah. I mean, if you're doing all these petty crimes, I doubt you're like, let me spend $60,000 on my teeth. You'd probably be like, I don't fucking need teeth. Yeah. I have drugs. <laughs> I have guns and drugs. Yes. But at the time, too, uh, in the 90s, when they kind of started really investigating this Kiesinger idea, uh, they couldn't find any of her family members. The most recent address for both sets of parents, for mm-hmm. both her mom or her dad, hadn't been updated since like 1975, 1976. Mm-hmm. So they didn't have any idea where these people were. And again, ni- early 1990s, pre-Facebook. Yes. <laughs> Pre-everyone knows where everyone is at all times kind of thing. And I mean, so. if your kid turns out to be a drug or drug smuggler and gun runner. Right. Do you always want to connect yourself back to that? 
Right. I mean, especially, too, if it's a missing person, you might, yeah. like, I mean, I imagine that's probably tough. She clearly wasn't into crime. And, yeah. two, I mean, she could have been estranged from her family, too. So they might not yeah. have even... They wouldn't know. She wouldn't go to care. them. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, that's the first place they'd look with her parents. So, in 1995... Uh, which is five years after taking over the Ramsey investigation, Tobias was interviewed uh, about the Lady of the Dunes. And during this interview, he stated that he believed he knew the identity of the victim and even better, had reason to believe that someone living in Provincetown at the time may have been a suspect in the murder. That's a ballsy thing to say. Yeah, bull statement. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at the time, he wouldn't state who he had suspected, uh, but he did share that a car registered to the suspect had been parked outside the house in Pembroke the night that Kiesinger was arrested, which he found in a 1974 police report. Uh, unfortunately, contact was recently made with Kiesinger's mother, uh, and she did agree to a DNA test to compare the DNA recovered from the victim to determine once and for all who the victim was. And to the surprise of pretty much everyone, experts determined that the DNA was not a match and that Kiesinger is not the Lady of the Dunes. So there have been other suspected IDs, nothing that was as promising as the case of Rory Kiesinger. During the investigation, one Rhode Island woman told Provincetown police that a female friend went walking with her dog which was also a beagle in June of 1974 <laughs> and she never returned. Personally, I'm just starting to think that beagles are doing this. Yeah, it's yeah. all the beagles. The beagle connection. It's a string of murderous beagles. Wait, so when did this friend come forward? <laughs> this is during the investigation, so it would have been in 1974, okay. 1975. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. I'm, like, I'm just picturing in the 90s. like <laughs> My, My friend's friend been missing just... for 20 years. <laughs> she went walking with her dog one time and just didn't come back. Uh, another tip came in the 1980s, uh, this time from a P-Town psychic. Oh, yep. Always a reliable witness. The psychic told Meads that the woman that they found was a Canadian nurse named Carolyn or Marilyn O'Leary. Now, not long after receiving that tip, a Canadian told their local Mounties that a composite sketch of the Lady of the Dunes looked a lot like a missing nurse named Carol Leary. And then another caller in Massachusetts reported an American nurse this time, but also named Carolyn O'Leary, who disappeared in the 1970s. However, in all of these cases, authorities did eventually find the missing women alive and well. In 1987, uh, after there was an update of the story that appeared in the Boston Sunday Globe, a Canadian woman, again, I don't know why it's always Canadians, just Canadians and beagles in this story. A Canadian woman called uh, to say that she had seen her father strangle a woman in Provincetown in the early 1970s and apparently decided to just, like, I don't know, sit on that information. <laughs> how do you do that? How do you just, yeah. And I then just, like, how, grow a conscience. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it was a repressed memory yeah, situation. And then she was, like, just reading the Boston Sunday Globe and was like, Whoa, my dad, my dad killed dad that did woman. That. <laughs> But unfortunately, in that case, by the time the authorities in the U.S. learned about this woman's statement, she had moved to Montreal. Uh, investigators did attempt to locate her, but they were never able to find her. Okay. Yeah. So you remember that your father strangled someone, you tell people, mm -hmm. and then you leave the country unable to be found. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, because of that, they can't really corroborate her claims. It could have just been hearsay. Yeah. So yeah. Beads had also heard reports in the summer of 1987. And this one was weird. Uh, a Canadian dentist <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, was visiting Provincetown and had a, quote, more than appropriate interest in the case. Hmm. I, I don't really know what the hell that means. <laughs> dentist teeth. Maybe they're in a jar somewhere. Oh... Or maybe he did all of her dental work. Also, Meads did receive a call in 1987 from a woman in Boston who claimed that her sister disappeared in Boston in 1972 and could potentially have been the Lady of the Dunes. But uh, as with all these leads, I mean, no dental records could be found or matched to the victim. Uh, so they really don't know... Hmm. If that has anything to do with it either. Unfortunately, former acting police chief Tobias, uh, he thinks that the lady may not have been an American citizen and was from somewhere else completely. Perhaps she was an orphan and maybe she didn't have any family. Which, the really I expensive mean. Really expensive dental work. like Right. And that too, like there was the, the New York style of dentistry. Yeah. It also like that thought makes this so much more tragic. Yeah. Because somebody went on vacation and just never came back. Right. And it's like after all this time too, somewhere in another country, someone may be missing their daughter or spouse sister whatever yeah who went to visit the u.s and just never came back and they'll never know 
maybe now because it's more of a global society and we have the internet and everything. At this point, the victim was born in what, 1925 to 1954 or something. So her parents are probably all dead. Yeah. The only people who might be left who would recognize her would probably be siblings. And even still, they might not know how to Google. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Or whatever. And then two other names of missing women. uh, Frances Ewalt of Montana and Vicki Lamberton of Massachusetts. They have both also been ruled out. But I couldn't find anything else about that. So, well, we don't know who she is. But how about who killed her? We could maybe try. There's been a couple leads that have popped up for that too. And we'll go into those now. First up, <laughs> there's a potential serial killer who has claimed her as one of his murder victims. Good. Um, currently, there's a man named Haddon Clark. He's serving two consecutive 30-year sentences in Maryland for the murder of 24-year-old Laura Hoteling, uh, who was apparently a co-worker of his, who he dismembered with the help of his brother. Good. He family had affair. Help. Yeah, yep. it's a family affair. It's just... Family bonding time. That's what they do on Thursday nights. Some people have (laughs) trivia night. Some people have game night. They just dismember coworkers. Great. Totally normal. He was also convicted in the murder of six-year-old Michelle Dorr in 1992. Mm. Well behind bars, Clark's been notoriously known for telling stories of more victims that he's claiming. One of his alleged victims, he claimed, was the Lady of the Dunes. Apparently, he had told a cellmate that... One of his alternate personalities, a woman named Kristen, best name for a... Homicidal alternate personality. Yeah, interesting. Uh, he claims that his alternate personality, Kristen, killed Lady of Dune, uh, the Lady of the Dunes in 1974, as well as nine-year-old Sarah Pryor in 1985. Now, in 2004, Clark did send a letter to a friend, which I'm sure that friend was stoked to get this letter, because in it, it contains two drawings. One of a handless naked woman sprawled on her stomach and another of a map point where the body was found. But he had also told investigators that he had killed at least 11 other women and buried some of them on the Cape where he grew up as a child. However, all the searches done by investigators with the information provided to them by Clark have turned up nothing, which leads several investigators, including Tobias, to kind of rule him out as the killer. Mm -hmm. Um, Apparently, he was diagnosed as schizophrenic, so that does sometimes lead to false confessions. I mean, authorities haven't officially ruled Clark out as the person responsible for the murder, but most people in the Provincetown Police Department doubt he was involved. However, he was in the area because in 1974, he was living in P-Town and working as a cook at the Moore restaurant, which was the year that the victim was murdered. So, I mean, he was in the area Mm -hmm. i mean to me he seems like the most likely suspect if we're gonna have any yeah Uh, clark himself is actually quoted as stating i could have told the police what her name was but after they beat the shit out of me i wasn't gonna tell them shit this murder's still unsolved and what the police are looking for is in my grandfather's garden so police have investigated Clark's family home and have turned up no evidence. Now, the final suspect, unfortunately, they only have two suspects. This one's a bit of a doozy. So this suspect is a a celebrity. Oh. Big time mob boss, Whitey Bulger. Oh. Uh, Apparently in 2011, an author named Sandra Lee, who incidentally enough is not a character from Greece. Oh. uh, Because I was like, wait... (laughs) It's not Sandra D. It's Sandra D. Yeah, but at first I was like, "Wait!" I was like, so I'm like singing the song in my head. She actually came out with her theory about the Lady of the Dunes, um, based off of her claim that she was in fact the first person to find the lady's remains, but she just never told anyone. How the hell do you do that? Like, yeah. oh, I found a dead body. I'm gonna keep it to myself. The crime writer claims that she was nine years old when she stumbled upon the corpse, stating, "Quote: She was in the thick of the brush. It was nothing shy of horrific." It was something I will never forget. So her family camped out at the dunes edge every July in the early 70s. So she was in the area. She says that she held her story inside due to the horror of the event. There is a local teenage girl who is recorded as discovering the body. uh, But Lee claims that she and her sister found the rotting remains first two days before the police were informed of the murder. She states that she was walking her dog. A beagle. (laughs) <laughs> I, actually, she didn't say what her dog was because I was wondering that too. It's I was like, I put it, it's a beagle. goddamn beagle. <laughs> just, just as me, just cut to like me doing research for this, and I just a Throwing board of just beagles <laughs> and then red string tying all the yes. beagles together. Yes. <laughs> what does it mean? It was the beagles. Um, how did uh, they use the shovel? <laughs> beagles don't have thumbs. How did they use the shovel then? 
Uh, so she so she said she was walking her dog uh, when her dog got excited about something and she began to hear a strange noise, which she described as the sound of someone holding a string of pearls. It was after she heard the sound that she smelled the remains, thinking at first that it was the stench of low tide, which is valid, yeah. uh, before seeing the body. Lee then stated that the body was, quote, face down. Her hair was a mess and I could see a gouge in the right side of her neck. Her arms were tucked down in the sand, so I didn't know any, anything was missing. I recognized the green blanket right away. The lower half of her body was covered with something. There's already some inconsistencies with that quote. Unless the crime scene was tampered with after Lee discovered it, but before the police arrived at the scene, there was nothing covering the lower half of the victim's body, mm. which Lee stated that she saw. Also, the victim's arms were not in sand, but in like pine needles and other forest debris. Yeah. Lee also states the sound that she heard stayed with her for years, as she realized later that the sound of clicking she heard was not someone playing with a necklace, obviously, uh, but the sound of maggots feasting on the remains. Is it really that audible? So, I'm glad you asked. Because I hate myself, I actually looked up the sound that maggots make when they're eating. It was a very wet squishing sound. No, no, I'm good. I'm good yeah. with that, actually. Forever. Uh, so, and also, too, I mean, it seems a little unlikely to me that she would have been able to hear that so clearly yeah. before even smelling or seeing the body. Yeah, no. So, like, yes, a, like, a large group of maggots definitely does make a sound, but I don't think it would be heard from really far away. Also, while I looked into it, I found a horrible fucking article about a woman who was hearing maggots in her head because they were living in her inner ear. Nope, stop. Why would yeah. you do that? Yeah. It's like bot flies. Yes. Bot flies are fucking terrifying. Yeah. It's like, well, that was the worst thing I've seen today. <laughs> I mean, I do feel kind of bad, like, completely picking apart this woman's story, but it just seemed to me that really kind of suspicious that a crime writer yeah. started telling people her story around the time she was releasing the book she wrote about the story she was telling people. Yeah. <sighs> so, um, I did check out the book uh, online. I wasn't able to get a copy of it because it's like $100 on Amazon. I wasn't going to buy it. But the reviews on Amazon are, are generally unkind. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, this book was written more as a work of fiction. And it also makes her story seem a little more fishy to me, too. I mean, I could just be, you know, cynical. I haven't talked to her. <laughs> I yeah. didn't interview her. Uh, when her book titled, quote, The Shanty, uh, it was released, she said, I wrote about the case in fictional form because technically it's still a pending investigation. It was difficult for me to write because I had to revisit a lot of demons and I thought I left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're probably wondering. What does this have to do with Whitey Bulger? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lee apparently strongly believes that the Lady of the Dunes was involved in prostitution and that she immigrated to Boston from a foreign country. And apparently that Whitey was into human trafficking as much as he was with drugs and money. Lee states, when people would come over from Ireland, Whitey's clan would intercept the women who, quote, fit the bill and they would end up in a tr house in Southie, which is Southern mm -hmm. Boston for those of you who aren't near Boston, where they would be groomed for human trafficking. Hmm. So uh, she thinks that the lady was one of these people who was groomed for human trafficking. Uh, and then she was killed in Boston around the 4th of July. Then Lee believes she was stored in a freezer before being transported to Provincetown where she was dumped. And why would Whitey have picked Provincetown? Well, <laughs> apparently, uh, he had a past as a gay for pay male hustler. What? <laughs> who uh, apparently he was a regular at a popular local LGBT hangout at the time known as the Crown and Anchor. And he had been actually linked to women with similar description to the Lady of the Dunes. So uh, there was a size 10 shoe imprint found the scene. That was one of the two. Mm -hmm. And apparently that's the same size as Bulger. Lee also states that the green towel that was found under the victim is believed to have been from the crown and anchor. So now, as I had mentioned earlier in the episode, P-Town is and was a safe haven for gay men and lesbians in the late 1960s and early 70s, as there were several um, LGBT friendly bars, including the crown and anchor. Mm -hmm. In 2006, author Howie Carr uh, he dropped a bombshell in his book, The Brothers Bulger. He claimed that Whitey got his start in the criminal underground as a teen after a lesbian pimp recruited him to hustle out gay bars, which to me sounds like a movie that needs to happen. Yes. But so Carr also writes, according to survivors of the area, Whitey worked out of a couple of gay bars on Stewart Street, particularly a joint called Mario's. Mario's. Mario. Which it's was me. also known as the sail away. As a young male hustler, he quickly became adept at rolling his tricks. 
His police record indicates an arrest for unarmed robbery on March 18th, 1947. Another of his favorite pickup spots was the Punch Bowl. That seems like a terrible name for a yep. bar. So the theory was also confirmed by a former Crown and Anchor owner named Staniford Sorrentino. Oh, yes. Which is the best name ever. Yes, it is. Hello, I'm Staniford Sorrentino. So he said in 1982, uh, he threw out Bulger's name during a tax evasion trial. Sorrentino stated that um, Bulger was known for being violent and had routinely stayed overnight at the Notoriously Gay Inn and at Sorrentino's home in the 1970s. Sandra Lee also claims that her stepfather would spend nights at the Crown and Anchor with Bulger when her family was in town and that her stepfather would quote stumble into the campsite during the wee morning hours. He was always inebriated and disheveled, often bruised and bloody, and sometimes wearing a green cotton blanket around his shoulders. As for the police's view on the Bulger connection, uh, they do state that Bulger has been placed in the area by witness testimony and photographs, but it could have literally been anyone else who went to the crown and anchor right and got the stupid blanket. I don't right. see anything that like other than the possible sex trafficking right i don't see any like major like he could have done it it was obviously him and not anyone else who went in this bar right and even still the connection with the towel in terms of for the bar that's just from lee i mean no one yeah. else has corroborated that information oh, that's true. so i mean i feel like the the whitey bulger connection is a little loose yeah um but i mean other than that there have n- not been any further suspects um and really little headway has been made in the case in recent years so i mean unfortunately the lady of the dunes she was buried in a simple grave marked unidentified female body found race point dunes july 26 1974 that's so sad Uh, and apparently for several years after she was buried uh someone who was never identified would commemorate the day she was discovered by placing flowers on her grave but um i mean that stopped I mean, in 2014, Detective Meredith Lober of the Provincetown Police Department told press that she was raising money to buy a new casket for the Lady of the Dunes as the unidentified woman's existing metal coffin was rusting away. Lober states that, quote, she's always some part of my day. Some murders are never solved. I refuse to believe that this is one of them. That's good. She still has someone rooting for her. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the story of the Lady of the Dunes. Oh, I notice you're raising your hand. Is it because you have a question as to what this has to do with sharks? Yes. Oh, well, oh, gee. You know, this was a huge waste of time. I'm sorry. I totally did that wrong. The secret of the Lady of the Dunes may lay somewhere that no one expected. In the classic summer shark movie, Jaws. In the summer of 2015, Jaws re-released in theaters to celebrate its 40th anniversary. And there, horror writer Joe Hill noticed a familiar face in the background of one of the scenes. Joe Hill, by the way, is the son of horror novelist Stephen King. Of course he is. (laughs) Who I mentioned briefly earlier in this story. So Jaws was filmed on Martha's Vineyard. It was filmed in the summer of 1974. Oh. The same summer in which the lady was murdered. Hmm. Around the 54-minute mark of the film, there's a large crowd scene, and Hill noticed a woman standing by the docks in a blue bandana, just like the one found with the body. Uh, He said about the woman, quote, You see her on that big screen, and she leaps out at you in that one moment. It was almost like telling a ghost story, and I was seeing the ghost of this murder victim superimposed on the movie. He wondered... What if the young murder victim, no one has been able to identify, has been seen by hundreds of millions of people in a beloved summer classic, and they didn't even know that they were looking at her? That's what if the crazy. ghost of the Lady of the Dunes haunts Jaws? It's not that wild a speculation to think that a person who was visiting Cape Cod in the summer of 1974 would make a stop to potentially being in the motion picture. Because, I mean, at the time it was said, like, if you were at the Cape in the summer of 1974, like, there's a good chance you're in Jaws. Yeah. yeah. Because they would just take massive crowd shots. The woman does bear resemblance to the most recent recreation of the Lady of the Dunes face. Unfortunately... There are no records of extras who appeared in the films due to the mass number of people coming and going on the sets. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, but Hill is encouraging anyone who may recognize her from that scene to shed some light on who she could be. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is, you know, right now it's nothing more than a wild theory, but yeah. it's definitely an interesting one. Yeah. Oh, definitely. So that Easy. is the shark collection. Uh, and that's the story of the Lady of the Dunes. Uh, real quick, I just want to kind of cover about my theories. Mm-hmm. This is just kind of something I thought of randomly because I'm thinking about this case a lot. Mm-hmm. 
She was decapitated with an instrument similar to a military entrenching tool. Mm -hmm. In Provincetown, there's the store called the Marine Specialties, which was opened in 1961. It's also known as the Army Navy Store. Yep. Marine Specialties is, quote, an eclectic treasure trove of salvage, surplus, slight IRs, closeouts, overruns, misprints, mistakes, spare parts, odd lost, cast offs, and new and nearly new items, including military equipment. So anyone could have gotten the right. spade. And he could have even bought it from there. Uh, another one. Another thing. Uh, the state of the body. So if we're going by the theory that she was murdered at the scene, uh, she would have had to have gone out there with someone and presumably gotten naked with said someone. This is true. Because, I, I mean, I've, obviously I've never tried taking clothes off a dead body. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. It's. I'm assuming it's something similar to a child throwing a fit. Well, like, that's what, I was, less, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, is, like more stiff. And it's, I mean, I, I've tried j- dressing and changing clothes of toddlers and children and stuff. And like when they play dead or don't yeah. help or whatever, it's a lot of effort to do that. Yeah. And we're talking a 60 pound child. Yeah. This is a 145 pound woman that would have shown in the pine needles. Yeah. And other debris near the body. Mm-hmm. There's no way that even with two people, even if it was two people at the scene. So, I mean, I guess again. And like for the pants, they could have cut it off, I guess, but for the pants to be intact. But the pants were intact. Exactly. Yeah. And like the fact that they were folded and put under the head. That like, seems like something like you knew them. That seems like something someone who cared about the body would have done. Or if you were lying comfortably naked. It's something you would probably do. Yeah, exactly. To put under your head. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, I'm going to kind of assume she was alive when she was undressed. Yeah. Um, and I mean, again, like, I don't know a lot about how different things would appear on the body, but I'm wondering if the sexual trauma that was done post-mortem with the wooden object, could maybe the killer have done that to cover up marks of consensual intercourse? Possibly. I don't know if that's even possible. So like, you know, if Mm -hmm. you're listening, if you know forensics, please, you know, let us know. Tell us on Twitter. Tell us in our email. I mean, it just seems strange given the complete lack of struggle and the way that she was just lounging around nude. Yeah. I'm thinking maybe like, I mean, maybe she had just had consensual intercourse Mm -hmm. and was just kind of lounging comfortably or sleeping post-coital or whatever. Yeah. That just seemed kind of... Yeah. Because then, like, the other theory they said was that she was sunbathing nude and happened to fall asleep. But, I mean, the area she was found in just seems really weird for both scenarios. Yeah. Because, like, nothing about sharp pine needles. Yes. Nope. I'll pass on that. And, like, pokey sticks and stuff. (laughs) And even, like, for sunbathing, there wasn't a ton of sun in the area. So, it's, I mean, I guess it's remote, so you wouldn't have to worry so much about somebody stumbling into you. Yeah. But the other thing that bothers me was the killer, like, how he covered his tracks. um, Yeah. With the removal of the hands and the front teeth and the blow to the head. Like, it just seems weird, the amount of mutilation and the uh, post-mortem uh, sexual assault that'd be unlikely that this was his first time killing it's this true. doesn't seem like yeah like an oh oopsie i did this yeah I was let really me completely angry. mutilate this woman's body it seems like escalation to me mm-hmm. to, to me it just it just screams serial killer oh yeah definitely i get that. or i mean i can kind of see the mob connection too mm-hmm. with like the removal of wouldn't they have put her in the water though isn't that like a mob thing I don't know That's about my other time thing, period. Is you're next to the ocean where there's a shit ton of sharks. Yeah. Wouldn't it have made more sense to dump the body in the water? Because that would have sped up decomp a bit too. I mean, maybe they were. They wanted it to be found where they possibly. Put her. Yeah. To me too. It just seems interesting how they even knew to get rid of those identifiers. Yeah. Because like in 1974, there wasn't like CSI. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's no true crime boom like there is now. So it would. The average layman wouldn't know a lot about how to identify somebody. Yeah. And like the fingerprints maybe, but the teeth? Probably not so much. I almost wonder if it's like, it's either somebody maybe with a criminal background Mm -hmm. or somebody with connections to law enforcement. Yeah, that too. Why didn't he finish removing the head? Yeah. I'm thinking he got interrupted. Exactly. That's what I was thinking too. He heard somebody coming and just got out of there. But then, I mean, no one's come forward saying, hey, I heard and or saw and or it's possible, but no one's come forward about it. Yeah. Another thing that bothered me too, like, why would he take the shoes and the shirt and her 
underwear, but not the jeans or her bandana. That suggests that she might have been identified with those items. Mm -hmm. So then I'm thinking maybe she wore a uniform. Yep. Which again kind of brings that cop theory back. But how would... If she was a police officer, they would have identified her. Well, they didn't have fingerprints. Didn't have DNA. Oh, that's They wouldn't true. have been able to take her DNA to put it in a system I'm thinking they didn't like, have DNA. No, like I'm thinking she was a police officer in Providence Town. I'm like, no one could be like, hey, that's Cheryl. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> police officer somewhere else. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I mean, I was thinking even like maybe like a park ranger or some other government agency too. I mean, Mm -hmm. I don't want to be like all conspiracy theory. Yeah. It just seems like a weird trophy to take. Yeah. If you were to take a trophy, why would you take her shirt, her shoes and her underwear? But not her jeans. But not her jeans. I, I don't know. There must have been some reason to take those items. But yeah. So, I mean, that's that's just kind of the, some of the theories that I thought were kind of weird. Yeah. So, um, with that, tell me about sharks. Okay. So, I kind of split my research into two different sections on shark attacks in general and then on the physical bite. So, obviously, I'm definitely pro-shark and I am all for shark rights. <laughs> obviously, I'm pro-shark. Yeah, obviously. The information that I got, it's a lot of statistics. Okay. For the um the shark attacks in general, just to show you how rare they are. So I got these statistics from the International Shark Attack File. Ooh. That's where the actual data came from. Um, and then a lot of the analysis was presented and interpreted by Tyler Bowling of the University of Florida. And all of these statistics are from 20, the 2017. There were 155 shark attacks worldwide that Whoa. were recorded. Yes, thank you. Recorded mm-hmm. to the International Shark Attack File. So 88 of them, of the 155, were unprovoked attacks, which is what we're going to end up focusing on okay. um, when humans are in the natural habitat and they don't they're not like provoking the sharks at all um so 30 of them were provoked where the human initiates contact so that's including people who are spearfishing because i mean you're not directly contacting the shark but you're chumming the water that you're swimming in i'm just picturing like someone provoking a shark to be like hey shark hey dick shark yes yes Come yeah. bite me, so shark. It, that counts as people um, who are feeding them and chumming the water from boats. This also includes people taking like hooks out of their mouths. 18 of them were attacks on boats. Two of them were scavenge attacks, which are attacks on humans after the human had died. Ooh. So again, they're pretty opportunistic feeders. Yeah. One attack happened in a public aquaria. 12 out of the 155 are considered doubtful. So <laughs> they were... They, okay. They were... <laughs> They were reported, but there isn't really a lot of evidence to show that it was actually a shark and not like a barracuda or like any other okay. kind of anything. It wasn't so they don't mean just like some dude with I mean, a bunch that's of probably... shark <laughs> teeth just, just stabbing somebody. I mean, it could be like somebody's like, I don't know, they did something and you're like, ah, shark bit me. But most okay. of it, they're just assuming that it was some other kind of something in the water. Okay. And then four of the 155 attacks were not confirmed. So I don't know. <laughs> different than doubtful but they're separated gotcha um so the five-year average for unprovoked attacks is 83 um with 2017 having 88 which is slightly higher than average uh-huh. um there were five fatalities from shark bites in 2017 from unprovoked attacks but the average is six the increase in in bites could that have anything to do with like global climate change i'm gonna get there okay sorry yes so the averages aren't always great to compare because there's so many fluctuations yeah, a lot like of different variables global warming how many people are going into the water and a lot of people are traveling too to places where there are more sharks in the water oh we just had our first shark death in massachusetts in like the first 30 years this past summer which is pretty crazy weird oh okay death by shark death by shark i thought you meant a dead shark oh no. like we just found the first no no no, no, shark no, no. Death. death by shark <laughs> by shark sorry like the shark funeral that. and yes. everyone gets together yeah to mourn the shark okay i get yeah. it i'm dumb yep. no you're good no i was probably not specific enough <laughs> Yeah, so there's the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So, like, we don't kill seals anymore, which is a great thing because I love seals. But that also means more food in the water for the sharks. Gotcha. So more sharks are traveling up here in the summer because there's a higher food abundance because we're not killing off the seals. And does that mean that maybe shark attacks will go down since there's more prey? Or yes. not necessarily because now there's more sharks in the area? Yeah, it's kind, kind of, of both of that. them. And okay. Most of the time, I'm going to get into this more, but sharks don't want to eat humans. They don't like us. The other thing about the average going up is more attacks are being reported. Okay. So it could have been that there were this many before, but they just weren't getting reported. Gotcha. As shark attacks. Maybe. So most of the unprovoked attacks happened in the U.S. Wow. Okay. Yep. So out of the 31 instances of unprovoked attacks in Florida in 2017, 59% of them were on people doing partaking 
in board sports, like surfing. Okay. 22% of them were people swimming or wading. 9% were people snorkeling or free diving. 3% were body surfing or just general horseplay out in the surf. 2% were scuba divers. And 5% were other shallow water activities, which I can't think of anything other than that, but that was what I was given. I'm going to go with peeing. Probably. (laughs) Yes. That's it. Okay. Okay. Stupid question. Yes. If a shark is biting you, Mm -hmm. should you pee? (laughs) I don't know. Well, I feel I mean, like, like I'd probably taste bad, pee. Right? I feel like I'd probably pee. I mean, I mean we I'd taste probably bad pee in anyways, general. Um, but like, is that a good, you know how, I mean, skunks I don't know. spray, should I just pee? Like, I see a shark coming, <laughs> should I just pee? wouldn't hurt. Yeah. I'm going to try it. Okay. Is there a shark coming at me? I'm going to pee. Good. I'm gonna probably going to do it anyways. Yes. Anyways, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so the 59% that were partaking in board sports, this could be because the surf zone is highly visited by sharks. So they spend a lot of time there and you're in their area. And then the splashing made by paddling and falling over, like falling, <laughs> could they make you very visible. Okay. So like yeah. laying on your surfboard and paddling, hey, you kind of look like a seal. There are three types of through like different categories of shark attacks. Okay. So the first is the most common one. It's called a hit and run. So what's that? Yeah. <laughs> so the shark bites you and just leaves and doesn't come back. Probably the shark just slaps you with its fin and runs away. Yes. Just mild sexual harassment. Just yeah. Slaps you in the ass and swims away. That comes later. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have concerns, but go on. <laughs> so um, with the hit and run, they probably mistook you for a normal prey. So most of the time, that's what happens. Mm-hmm. Is they just mistake you for something else. They give you a little nibble and then they leave. Um, the second kind is a bump and bite, which is kind of the slaps your ass thing. <laughs> so they kind of nudge you and then they come back and they bite you. They're curious. The way I kind of look at it is like, Yoshi. I'm still laughing at bump and bite. I'm sorry. That sounds like really perver- perverted. Yes. They're, they're curious. They want to know. They're trying to figure out what the hell you are. Yeah. They're literally, hey, their options are to is kind of food? poke you and then to try to eat you. Not hey, like eat hey, you, but like give food? you a little nibble. Yeah, more yeah. or less. Yeah. The other thing with the bump and bite, you kind of get two injuries because their skin is like sandpaper. The shark will kind of leave a little bit of scraping from when they bumped you because they look nice and smooth. They are not nice and smooth. Um, You got a little nibble and you got some scrapes. Fun. Um, <laughs> Great. And then there's the sneak attack, which... Of course, that's the one that everyone hears about. It's also the most rare, where there is no warning at all, and they bite you more than once. It's like, the way I like to look at it is, not all humans are good. Same with sharks. Like, some cats are just assholes, and that's just how they are. Right. Like, there's, all sharks aren't the same. There are some that just really just don't give a shit about you, and then there's some that are really curious that are going to be like, hey, what's this? Right. And then there are some like, I don't care what you are, I'm just going to eat you. So, but just think about how many people go into the ocean every day, 365, and only 88 unprovoked attacks happened in those 365 days. And out of those um, 88, only five of them were fatal. So if sharks were intentionally targeting humans, then there'd be a much higher fatality total. Like (laughs) if they were just like out to get us. So when the sharks become sentient and they... Yes. Gotcha. Yes. We're fucked. Good to know. Um, Sharks play a vital role in marine ecosystems. But they're being overfished a lot for shark fin soup and overhunted because the general public usually views them in a bad light. Yeah. So fishing for soup is... Why? (laughs) Right? Fishing for soup is more cruel than most people think. So the live... This is kind of sad and very violent, but the live sharks are caught and then they remove the fins while they're still living and then just toss them back overboard. So now these sharks can't move. They just sink to the bottom, either bleed out, suffocate, or something else eats them. It's not even like... It's, it's really sad. I mean, what does a shark fin even taste like? Nothing. And yeah, it has soup. no medicinal properties. Huh. Yeah. It doesn't add any flavor to anything. And it doesn't have... Also, can I just say, sharks store their urine in their tissues. So you're literally just drinking, you're eating shark pee. That is what you're eating. Oh, so they wouldn't care if I peed. They're, they just pee everywhere well, in a shark. Well, that's to make sure that their cells have, like, they don't take on too much water because of the salt content with huh. osmosis. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, they keep... I'm still planning my getaway from a shark urine <laughs> routine. Go ahead, yeah. But anyway, sharks don't attack people for the hell of it, and they really need our conservation efforts more than yeah. ever. But yeah, so now on to the actual shark bite. Okay. So if there's a direct bite, it's usually like where they just latch on. It's usually crescent shaped. Like okay. same like yep. if a human was to bite you or a dog, I guess that works too. <laughs> or literally anything because pretty anything. much everything has teeth and a crescent shape. S- yes. Yeah. So it could also be multiple parallel lines. If like you moved or the shark moved when they bit down and it's like a scraping pattern. Oh, okay. Um, both are possible. So I'm going to repeat this a lot in the next couple minutes. Always go see a doctor. <laughs> 
even if you're not sure that it's a shark bite. <laughs> most bites don't remove a considerable amount of tissue. It's just scraping cuts normally, um, or just like puncture cuts. There are exceptions where like dead flesh and potentially whole limbs need to be removed after a bite. That's, again, it's a bit of a rarity. So sharks' mouths are very dirty. So on top of the expected physical trauma, you have to worry about infection a lot, mm. which is why, even if it doesn't look that bad, go to the doctor. They don't typically prescribe a um, an antibiotic right away because a lot of marine stuff is immune to our antibiotics. Oh, which is, um, yeah. I don't it's good to know goal. that the ocean is literally just breeding things that can kill us if they grew legs. I mean, I'm not <laughs> trying to keep people out of the ocean. I'm actually kind of trying to do the opposite, but whatever. Um, <laughs> there are many studies currently working to discover what antibiotics work best for shark bites. Okay. It's getting a lot of different groups involved, which I really enjoy. So on top of doctors, pharmacists, and biologists working together, there's been a lot of help from local fishermen, which is pretty cool to get the people who... Yeah, I mean, the people who typically... Get bit by sharks? Right. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so they catch them, they swab their mouths. Hug um, them. Hug them, and yeah. then they release them. Okay. But it's really important to get the public involved because people tend to care a little more mm -hmm. when they have time or money invested in something. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. So yeah, that's always exciting. Fish science. Yeah. But shark mouths can be really gross, and they do a lot of serious damage. Hmm. Most attacks aren't fatal due to modern medicine and the fact that sharks aren't trying to kill you. Uh -huh. Yeah. So if sharks get... are trying to kill us? Yeah, all of them. Yep. Yep. The bacteria. Vendetta. Personal and vendetta. Stinky mouths. Yes. Shark mouths. Yes. Go to the doctor. All right, cool. Great research. Hey, thanks. Hey, thanks. This is this is my thing. Yeah, I know. I Unfortunately, there's not a ton of um, fish murders. I can t I'll take what I can get. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, so moving on, we'll just kind of do a quick sort of discussion wrap up. Did you have any thoughts on the case? Um, it's definitely interesting. I think it's weird that this is such a big case so close to home and I've never heard of it before. I had never heard of it until um, My Favorite Murder talked about it mm -hmm. in one of their episodes yeah. a couple months ago. And and exactly, I mean, especially to my mom, your your dad, like our family would have routinely visited yeah. Cape Cod in the 1970s. Yeah. But I mean, I'm sure our family was there in 1974. Yeah. Oh, probably around that time too. Yeah. I mean, because my mom would have been 10 mm -hmm. and they, my mom definitely has memories of going to the Cape in the summer. So yeah. it's, it's entirely likely that our family was there. Was there. Oh, we didn't mention we're related by the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> Allison is my first cousin. Yes. <laughs> her, her father and my mother are siblings. But yes, and I know, I agree. It is weird. And I mean, yeah. you know, we used to visit Provincetown fairly often. Yeah. And I mean, to be fair, nowadays things are different, I think, than it would have been in like the 90s and yeah. 2000s when you were going and not in the 90s for me. Yeah. Because murder wasn't as cool yes. <laughs> as it is now. Like yes. that out of context sounds really bad. Yeah. But like crime, like there's a big boom right now in the true crime community mm -hmm. um, in terms of what is quote unquote okay yeah. to find interesting. Mm. And I'd say like in the nineties, even early two thousands, like you wouldn't want to be broadcasting like, hey, don't forget unsolved murder here. Come yeah. to Provincetown. Like instead you're gonna yeah. be like, we have art and like good food and yes. look at the pretty beaches. Bring your children here. They yeah. won't get murdered. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't yeah. know why they're British. But <laughs> and I think this story really got a lot of attention with that Jaws connection. Mm -hmm. Cause, and that, yeah. But that was only in 2015. So, I mean, that's kind of when this story was really put back in the forefront. Yeah. But, I'm just happy that there's still somebody working on yeah, the case. Yeah, for. Yeah. We're at a point where I don't know if they'll ever figure it out. I don't either. And that's what I was going to say. Unfortunately, it's tough because these really, really, really old cases. Like, who are you going to talk to? Right. You know, Find killer's all the people probably dead. Here. Yeah. At this point, or very old. Yeah. Um, you know, like the Golden State Killer. He's like, what, 72, 73? And they just caught him last year. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we've been trying to think of how to end each episode mm -hmm. in a way that's not kind of a total bummer. Yes. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, we are going to be talking about dark stuff. So uh, we thought what we would do is something, a uh, little little corner called the bitch banter, where we find uh, weird and or stupid articles <laughs> yes. to uh, that kind of relate to the story to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, so I found this article. I think you're going to enjoy it. BBC News released an article with the title, Divers Swim with One of the Biggest Great White Sharks Off Hawaii. 
I've, yes. I don't think I've read this article, but I've seen all the pictures, and she's just so pretty. Okay, so I'll recap it for you. Uh, so apparently a team of divers came so close to one of the biggest great white sharks on record that they were able to pet it, and I question their sanity. Or that would be considered a provoked attack. <laughs> they literally pet it. So the, the shark was nearly 20 feet, 6 meters long. Uh, and it weighed an estimated 2.5 tons. It's believed to be the same shark that was tagged about 20 years ago that they affectionately nicknamed Deep Blue. So it was attracted to the area under Oahu, uh, Oahu South Shore by the delicious carcass of a dead sperm whale in the area. Ooh, yummy, yummy. The dead whale had brought a group of tiger sharks to the area, which were feeding mm. on the whale before Big Mama Deep Blue showed up to get a literal piece of the action. Yes. The divers originally there to film the tiger sharks after most likely peeing themselves in shock because that's what I would have done. My tactic decided to hang out with deep blue when she started to quote brushing up against the boat unquote. One of the divers named I shit you not ocean Ramsey, which hmm. cannot be her real name. Nope. So yeah. So ocean Ramsey stated she was just this big, beautiful, gentle giant wanting to use our boat as a scratching post. We went out at sunrise and she stayed with us pretty much throughout the day. Hmm. And then in a quote that I identify with, Ms. Ramsey said the shark was, quote, shockingly wide. But anyways, great whites are rarely ever seen around Hawaii as they prefer cooler seas. Uh, so they were kind of surprised to see her there. Uh, and it's also believed that Deep Blue may be pregnant. <gasps> oh, that's so exciting. Which is why she was so safe to swim around. Also, Deep Blue is believed to be about 50 years old mm -hmm. and has its own Twitter account, which are we, we are just immediately following after this episode wraps. Yes. 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 We're following. Everyone go follow Deep Blue. Yes. <laughs> she's pregnant. She's, she's, ladies are doing it for themselves. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed this. I know it was really, really long. Uh, our going forward the episodes probably aren't going to be this long yes this is both something that we just both feel really strongly about yes and um obviously i mean we'll get better at it as we go yeah. trial and error <laughs> i mean we've got a bunch of different ways to reach out to us if you want to talk to us we are both really down to talk about whatever yes um if you want to talk about something we said in the episode if you have any corrections if you know please be correct nice. us if we say something dumb yes but be nice yes be nice, nice about correcting us <laughs> Or else we'll roast you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, definitely give us a follow on Twitter. We are at Death Dames Pod. You can give us a follow on Instagram as well. That's at Death Dames Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, of course, you can follow us on our personal Instagram or Twitter accounts. Those are also yeah. linked in the bios. Yeah. I mean, share your science, history, or true crime stories at our email. It's deathdamespodcast at gmail.com. And we do want to eventually do uh, listener stories episodes where we can share. So if you have mm -hmm. any local true crime stories that happened around you, if you have any sort of cool discoveries that you've made in terms of science or archaeology, history history, anything really cool, or just any cool stories you want to share with us about any of those topics, please do. I also accept stories about pets doing weird things. Pictures are appreciated. Yes. Send us pictures of your weird pets. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, we love having discussions on uh, these topics and more. So really don't hesitate to reach out to us. And, uh, you know, if you liked this and you want to hear more, please consider subscribing or following, you know, yes. leave a comment, uh, rate and review, share with anyone who you think might like our weird podcast. Yes. We're definitely looking to try to grow this and, yeah. uh, you know, we want to be able to continue it. So definitely as you know, any kind of support was really, really appreciated. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. And then remember, remember smart, smart is, is sexy. Bye.